Morning, good afternoon, hello, and welcome to Developing with CockroachDB, a developer-focused success program with a series of workshops and office hours to help you tackle your biggest developer aspirations. And and we want to get we want you to get the most out of CockroachDB. Um, we're assuming a few things that you know SQL, that you know Postgres. Maybe you're a little bit newer. Maybe you've been in the cloud. Um, we want to we want to bring bring we want you to bring us on your journey. And how can we help you? We want to be your resource. Um, every week on Wednesdays is a module, uh, which we want to be very heavy keyboard, which today is no exception. And every Thursday, same bat time, same bat channel is office hours, which is basically an open AMA, ask me anything. Uh, theoretically, you could ask us questions about the module today, but you can also ask us anything about CockroachDB. We do reserve the right to not know the answer, but we'll figure it out together. Um, also, this is not the only channel of communication. This is one channel to become excellent CockroachDB developers. There's also Cockroach University, there's community Slack, there's forums. We're gonna post the links throughout the show. Feel free to reach out in your most comfortable path. But in the meantime, today for the next hour, if you like to ask questions, please do so and we will get to them if we can. Hello, Dimitri. In the meantime, I would like to introduce my two guests this week, which is focused on query optimization. Stephen Hand is an architect, enterprise architect with CockroachDB. I'd love to hear, what is query optimization, Steve? Rain, query optimization is an important part of any uh, database development effort. And it's the way to get the most out of your database and to please your customers the best with best uh, performance and lowest costs. That's awesome. And tell me, how long have you been playing with SQL? Oh my, I've, I was a software <laughs> developer for 27 years. And for most of that career, I focused on databases. I was the one who would raise my hand to say, ooh, ooh, I, I wanna own the database part of this, this application. What? And uh, it was a lot of fun. So. Uh, I'll say 20 years. Just wow. Making it, uh, so are close. you are you a DBA type of background or a developer uh, background? Well, or a, a developer background. Lots cool. of the languages folks would recognize on the call and uh, a lot of the databases that people would recognize on the call. But uh, I'm really thrilled with CockroachDB. I, I'm really excited at where it is in the, the amazing story of the development of relational databases and how they how they uh, are driving so much. Yes, yes, definitely. And Jesse Lynn, you are also an enterprise architect. Uh, tell me about yourself. What's your journey like? Yeah, I've been with Cockroach Labs since December last year. We actually, Steve and I actually joined on the same day. What? And, um, yes. That's awesome. <laughs> right this, yeah, That's awesome. totally. Yeah. And uh, I, um, actually the only woman on our team and uh, I've been working with database um, yeah since 2000 I guess. <laughs> That's awesome Jesse. welcome to the show. It's so good to have you both. As I said we are focused on query optimization today. Uh, Steve is leading this module which is also available on the developer success repo, which is an Apache open source repository. If you have anything to input, we'd love to hear it. In the meantime, you can follow along for the lab. Steve, tell me about query optimization. Okay, cool. Um, I guess you're switching over to my screen so that, that I can share. I'm gonna be light on the slides and we're, we're gonna have more of a friendly keyboard mediated conversation. And as Rain said, feel free to ask any questions. Jesse and I are, are happy to to address them in, in the flow of everything. This is this is real relaxed. But um, from looking here at this the first slide, we, we're talking about query optimization. And you know, given the architecture, here's how you design and tune. And uh, I want to give kind of like a brief look back to our previous live stream, where Fabio gave, gave a great architecture 
overview for CockroachDB. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just want to remind you that CockroachDB is a full relational database. It's, a, it's fully compliant with uh, SQL standards and it's high performance and it's built on top of a key value store. Uh, it's composed of equal peer nodes that, that have a shared nothing architecture. And this brings a, a really, really uh, you know, modern design. It's, it's really a, a native cloud database, but uh, it has distributed transactions that are fully ACID compliant. And the data can be moved around for best uh, performance and to, for things like, um, you know, giving the best user experience. And while it's doing that, it's highly survivable. It can survive uh, unexpected outages or planned outages for things like rolling upgrades. And you can, uh, it's elastic. You can scale in and scale out. And uh, the, uh, the the part of it that Fabio brought out last week that I just want to uh, kind of call out again is in this diagram on the right, you'll see that CockroachDB has those three nodes and then it takes the data and it makes multiple copies of it for high uh, resilience, high availability, and it spreads them around. So that's it for the architecture. I want to move on and let's just talk about what we're going to talk about today with, with regard to um, the agenda. We're going to talk about schema design a little bit. We're going to talk about tuning techniques like, well, what, what can we do? What, how do we gain visibility into what, what kinds of things we would even want to do? And we'll talk about it in kind of like an uh, uh, in introduction way and then some advanced techniques as we, as we go. So let's talk really briefly about this whole process. And you can see over on the left this really neat diagram. We start with the data model and the data model is basically something that comes from your business problem. And you think in terms of entities and attributes and relationships at, at, at this level. Uh, from there, you go to the uh, data definition language uh, from a logical design to a physical design. And you make a lot of interesting and creative design choices at each of these levels. Uh, from there, you move to tuning your queries against that database. And the goals when you do this are, are pretty obvious. You, you want to optimize runtime. That can be both in terms of queries per second and minimizing the runtime of individual queries. And benefits, as you can expect, are to reduce uh, consumption of resources and that reduces costs. It produces a better user experience for your customers. So these are the reasons why as a developer, you would care about this whole query optimization process. Um, you know, you can't change everything all at once. So to simplify the process, we're going to make some assumptions. First of all, the data model is mostly fixed and the data definition language is somewhat adjustable. You'll see what I mean. But rather than creating you know, new tables from scratch, we'll be mostly tweaking existing tables and adding things like indexes. Uh, where we'll also spend time is the, on the fact that queries can be rewritten and there are a host of uh, database features in CockroachDB that you can bring to the table to also optimize and tune your queries. So um, here is just a, a, a brief example, like a for instance of uh, moving from the logical design to the physical design. One of your first choices is what data type are you gonna use for the primary key of your tables? This shows three really popular options. On the far right are sequences, in the middle are integers that would, are, would be generated with a unique row ID function. And on the left is the UUID that would be a, a universally unique ID. And it's boxed over there in green because that's the preferred approach with modern distributed applications. And it's absolutely the preferred approach with CockroachDB. Sequences were a, uh, a best practice with monolithic old school databases, but actually in distributed application design and distributed uh, databases like CockroachDB, that's an anti-pattern. And to, to give you an idea of the difference, here is a, a, a brief uh, you know, chart showing uh, some performance metrics on, on real customer data on insert rate. And you can see at the top that the UUIDs had, had a tremendously better performance. And you might ask, well, as a developer, uh, maybe I like um, integers. Maybe that's what I'm comfortable with. Uh, this is a new world where, you know, we're all expanding our skill sets and, and <laughs> uh, learning new paradigms. And yeah. so uh, the transition to UUIDs is, is really good. Uh, don't worry about size as you do that. Uh, UUIDs are binary in CockroachDB. So that, that, that really helps this. Uh, but uh, I love that you motivation. <laughs> Go ahead, Jesse. Sure. Yeah, and UUID is only two bytes, so it's not oh, that nice. large. Yeah. Yeah. 
And Stephen, are you going to talk about uh, the hot range impacts for different oh. um, user I'll, data types? I'll, I'll talk about it. That's a, that's a great uh, topic to bring up, Jesse. Uh, the, you might ask, well, what is the problem with uh, serial uh, as a data type or integers that have this unique row ID? The problem is the, uh, in two kinds. With serial data type, uh, you have to do a kind of a global coordination um, in, in the database. And that's because these are these are incrementing values that are either increment one at a time or they increment in chunks. And there's a lot of uh, coordination that has to happen. Universally unique IDs, in contrast, don't need to be coordinated with anything. And nice. so that, that makes them fast. The second problem is that uh, with uh, both UUIDs and this this uh, integer ID that's uh, the the row ID is that the values are, are are like ascending. They're they're in either not strict, but they're in some kind of close incrementing order, and that causes data access to uh, kind of zoom in within the database on those values. And because of the way CockroachDB stores those values, uh, that will tend to concentrate the workload to a, a small number of nodes. If you nice. use uh, that then you'll basically, you could have a cluster of dozens of nodes, but you might, uh, by using the wrong uh, data type, limit the overall power of that cluster to just one or two nodes. So you, you, you don't want to do that. UUIDs are, are, are wonderful for so many reasons like that. Thanks, Jesse. That's awesome. Great question, Jesse. Thank you. And if you have any questions and you're watching this, please feel free to chime in in the chat and we will get your questions answered as well. Take it away, Stephen. Super. So let's let's kind of pivot to tuning techniques, which is really where I think we, we, we want to have this this conversation. And in our tuning toolbox, we've got several things. We've got query uh, database statistics and we've got query planning. We've got secondary indexes and we've got join types. So, I mean, th this is just an introduction. We, we could talk in, on any <laughs> of these topics at length. And there are many more topics that uh, are not in this list. But uh, let's 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 jump into statistics. And, and, and frankly, you all, if you're interested in deep diving in any of these, we are just briefly touching these today so we can get straight to the lab. But if you're interested in diving into these, let us know and we will make that happen. Great. Yes. Um, now, CockroachDB collects statistics on its own data. And you might have this question. It's like, well, uh, why does CockroachDB need to have statistics on the data when it actually has all of the data itself? And the answer is that uh, CockroachDB has an amazing query optimizer that will take the, the SQL that you give it and analyze the data and come up with a query plan, which is a, a high, high performance distributed way that the cockroach brings all of those nodes uh, or all of the relevant nodes to bear on the problem to solve it as quickly as possible. And in order to make the right kinds of decisions, uh, the, the query optimizer needs information on the data. What kind of information? Things, basic things like the number of rows, uh, maybe the number of null values in, in a given column, uh, the number of distinct values of, of a particular column, and then the dis distribution. Basically, it wants to create a histogram on all of the different columns. And then with that information, CockroachDB can choose the right query plan for your SQL. And you might ask, well, okay, this is this is fine, Steve, but why are, why are you bringing it up? Why does this matter to me as a developer? Well, it matters for two reasons. One, as you go through your uh, uh, performance tuning process, you're going to be running load tests. You're going to be running performance tests, and they often occur in two phases. First, you have a load up the data phase, and then second, after that data is loaded up, you have a phase where you're actually executing the test. And uh, CockroachDB will automatically uh, collect and update statistics. But if you do things in this pattern that I described, a, a big bulk load phase, uh, CockroachDB might not have enough time to figure out that it needs to update those statistics automatically. So you as a developer would be, would be well advised to uh, tell CockroachDB, it, you need to go ahead and update these statistics. And what that means is that w now that they're updated, they'll be accurate and ready to apply to the uh, load test phase of your test. If you don't do it, uh, in that time frame between when, Cockroach, when the data is loaded and CockroachDB updates the statistics automatically, you might actually get worse performance than, than uh, you, know, you should because uh, the, the optimizer is working on stale statistics. Now, how do you do it? It's very simple. You just so Stephen, to manually tell Cockroach. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. 
So how often does CockroachDB collect stats? Is there a uh, threshold that we will look that, at? That's a great question, Jesse. It's, a, it's actually a complicated uh, question to ask because uh, the, the optimizer has sort of a dilemma. The more frequently that the statistics are updated, then the more frequently, you know, the more accurate they're going to be and the better the optimizer can, can work. But on the other hand, collecting statistics is itself a rather uh, you know, intensive operation that runs in the background, but it competes with the workload, the front you know, workload that is, is being issued by clients. So you wanna find this sweet spot where you're doing it often enough, but not too often. And CockroachDB mm. has a lot of, of rules, a lot of uh, you know, guidelines, like when a certain percentage of the rows in a table have changed, then it will do it. And it does it in a way that also tries to spread it out rather than making a big uh, load uh, that, that can uh, impact performance. So the bottom line, Jesse, is there's there's no good answer, but there are a lot of, of, of rules that try to make it do the uh, the best job of balancing those different uh, you know goals. Yeah, I just want to add, I think the default threshold is 500 rows or 20% of table changes. And then um, when CockroachDB collects that automatically, we actually will throttle the um, the resources that Autostats use um, so that it doesn't impact the front end traffic. Um, just wanted to add that um, on, on top. Yeah. Very cool. That's great. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah. Statistics are, are, are really important. It, you might ask, well, okay, so I, I want to do this. How do I do it? You use the analyze statement. Uh, there, there are a couple ways to do it, but the analyze statement is, is uh, one way to do it. You just say analyze the table, and then it, then it will do it. Now, I mentioned that this is uh, important in the context of performance testing. So you, you do your bulk load, you tell CockroachDB to update the statistics, then you run your test, and you can be confident that it has the right data. But there's also an application reason why you might do this as a developer. And that's because a lot of applications have a similar pattern. Maybe you have a daily ingest of partner data or you know some, some temp similar type of bulk operation. You can code the, the analyze table into your application to make sure that it runs uh, at, at optimum performance. As I said before, CockroachDB, you know, we'll figure things out, but uh, you can help it if you, if you do that. So let's pivot to the keyboard. We've talked to slides a lot, so let, let's, uh, Let's yes. make a make a transition here. It's now I'm going to be part. showing everything in um, this uh, this particular web page that you can access yourself. You can see here uh, it's been shared. This is out on GitHub, and I'm just going to be copying and pasting. This is our query optimization uh, uh, workshop, and this is the lab. And what I have done is I've I've done the uh, the first part of the lab where I set up uh, some data in in CockroachDB, and I'm using a cockroach DB free tier, and you can get that yourself. It's pretty amazing to have a uh, uh, your own uh, cloud, your own database in the cloud for free. And so this is this is what I uh, set up. I, I loaded it with data, but let's jump here to talking about statistics. So first of all, I want to create a database to play in. So let me uh, go right here, and I'm just going to do create database test and Let's switch over to using it. To do that, you use the use statement. Okay, now we're using it. You can see the prompt has now changed a little bit to reflect that. And let's create a test table. And as you see me copying and pasting, you'll notice that I'm using that best practice that I recommended earlier of using a UUID as the primary key. There you can see it right here. Create table users and PK is the uh, primary key. It's got a name and a height as additional uh, columns. So, and with that said, let's uh, just think it'd be helpful if we showed the, the uh, table definition using show create table. So this is a, a, a nice uh, format to show the different things. And it, it, it illustrates, of course, that, you know, the constraint here is that we've got this primary key. Hey, Stephen, but, have we yeah. um, covered okay. how primary key in SQL database translate into our key value store? Uh, I have not covered that uh, today. Uh, that question. was part of the architecture conversation, but let me it, it put it this way. Um, relational databases in general need a, a primary key. And uh, the, uh, the primary key is, is what should uniquely identify the rows in your table. And uh, beyond uh, 
beyond that, uh, the CockroachDB, because it's a key value store at the lower layers under the hood, uh, CockroachDB uses the primary key as the key in, or at least part of the key, I should say, in its internal key value store. Does that address the question you're asking, Jesse? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why, you know, choosing a primary key has a direct impact of how we store data and how we, you know, search and access data. So it's, uh, I would say it's one of the most critical choices that a developer can make on, on, on developing with uh, Cockroach DB. Thank you, Jesse. That's so true. In fact, it's so important that uh, like like any relational database, you're not required to define a primary key on your tables. But if and if you don't, then CockroachDB will under the hood assign a, a something that's like a primary key on your behalf. But it's better if you make that choice yourself. And so if we uh, want to give this uh, table some sample data, I'm going to give it three rows of data. And notice that I'm doing it with just one statement. We may talk about that a little bit later in our conversation, but you can do multiple inserts uh, or insert multiple rows with one single insert statement. And let's take a look at it just to give you an idea. And see, here's the, the, the unique ID that we were talking about. Now, nice. now let's, let's look at the statistics. You've, we've got a command called show statistics for a table. And you can see right here, it, it doesn't show much. It's 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 kind of empty. I mean, it's got these different rows, but but look at all these zeros. <laughs> it's going to tell CockroachDB that we've given it this data. So I'm going to say analyze with users. See, that was pretty quick. And but now, what happens when we look at the statistics again? You should see a difference. And no. there it is, indeed. I see that it was pretty quick to analyze this database, which has like three rows or so, but um, mm -hmm. what what if it came across a big data? Like, would yes. it take a few few actual seconds? Would it take a few minutes, a few days? It, that's a great question. It, it could <laughs> uh, easily take multiple seconds or wow, even multiple cool. minutes. It's, cool. it, it would not be typical to take a, a huge number of, 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 of minutes, but- uh, uh, But it could. It, it could, yeah, it, it, it's yeah. all, you know, in the, the class of it depends. It depends yeah. on the size of the database. Okay. Yeah. So that's about, about statistics. Let's let's talk about tuning techniques. And as I said, CockroachDB has this amazing query optimizer. And query optimizers are complex. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could just ask the, the database that you're using, please explain what you're doing to me. And, uh, you know, happily enough, CockroachDB can do exactly that. And the command to, to do it is explain. So we're going to talk about explain and, and, and get it to, to start explaining how it's doing queries for us. So uh, what I'm going to do is move on to now lab three in, in, in this, uh, this repo. And to do that, I'm going to switch to a different database. This is the database that I set up earlier. It was when I was uh, showing things. This is the TPCC database where TPC stands for Transaction Processing Performance Council. And the second C is uh, you know, basically their performance benchmark C, TPCC. It's, it's been a standard for at least 20 years. And it's, it's a really good thing to use with databases because it's uh, vendor independent. So we've switched over. Let's, uh, let's uh, start using explain. So I'm going to take a really simple query select the C underscore balance from customer. And now I'm going to put this word explain in front of it. Let's see what it does. Now we get this output that we typically call the, the, the plan or, or the explain plan. And some things I want to call out is, first of all, yeah, it looks maybe a little intimidating, all this info and stuff like that. And it can get much more complicated. But I want to help you unpack it so that it's not so intimidating and so that you can get the value out of it that as a developer you're looking for to optimize your queries. Uh, some things I'd like to call out, first of all, are first of all, it's it's useful to kind of read these things from the bottom up. And mm -hmm. when we read it from the bottom up, you can see, first of all, that it's doing a scan and it's got this thing here at the bottom called spans and it's doing a full scan. And that means it's just scanning the whole, whole thing. And given that we don't have a where clause in this query, it's, you know, select the balance from customer, 
of course it has to access all of the rows to do that. It tells us the table, customer, and then it's got this at sign to tell us which index it's using. And you might be surprised, this, this is basically saying it's using the primary key to, to uh, scan this table. And it gives an estimated row count of 150,000 rows, 100% of the table. So this is just a real basic type of thing. Let, let's move on and, and, and explore some other types of output you'll see. Let's limit the query to just 10 rows, and you'll see a slightly different type of scan. It's a limited scan, see? Everything else is pretty much the same, except that we've got the limit shown. The estimated row count now is just, just 10. It's still scanning the customer table using the primary index, or which indicates that we're using the primary key. And sometimes these full scans can be bad. Sometimes they can be good. They're always something that, you, as a developer, you want to pay attention to. So here's an example uh, where when you see a full scan, it's actually a bad thing. It should raise a red flag and say, I, I, as a developer, I need to do something about this to improve the performance. So the query is select C underscore zip from customer. But in this case, we have a where clause where city equals Austin. And now it's doing a full scan of the primary uh, key, uh, primary index on the customer table. Everything else is, is scanning 150,000 rows, but it's only it's estimating that it's only going to actually use 157 rows. So just think about how inefficient that is. We're going through 150,000 rows just to filter out and, 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 and keep about 157 rows. Uh, this, by the way, introduces you know, another node in the output, where before we just had one, one node. Now we've got two. We've got a scan phase followed by a filter phase. But we can do better. I'm, I'm sure you think, you know, we can hey, do better. And that's where hey, Steve, yeah, go ahead. we can do better. Uh, we have an awesome question from Anna. Um, does Cockroach have a rule that index is used when it's supposed to return less than 10% of data from the table? That's a great question. In, in fact, that, that's, this is, as a developer, um, sometimes I'm on, on interviews and I, and I like to ask people questions of when is an index not used yes. and, and you're, you're calling out a situation indexes are there to help but they, they are not magic they don't always help and because of that <laughs> the optimizer knows when to use an index and when it's not uh, going to use an index I've got nice. a, a slide a little bit later that shows some uh, kind of index best practices but uh, just imagine that uh, an, an index is useful when it can eliminate as much data from being considered. You don't want to scan through data and then just throw it away as we showed before. Nice. And the, the value is different. It might be 10%, it might be 20%, um, but uh, uh, at some point the optimizer in CockroachDB, just, just like, like uh, the, the question was asked, will decide, no, this, this index is, 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 is or is not good. Um, if, and, and, and so the, the, the topic that the, you know, the technical word for this is, uh, you want your, your indexes to be on data that has high cardinality. That ha that means it has a lot of distinct values, but beyond that, you also want it, the index indexes to be on columns where that data is highly selective so yes. that, um, and it depends on the query, a uh, given yeah. column, it could be very selective, same column, but a different query. It could it could not be selected, and CockroachDB okay. uses those statistics to to make that choice. Awesome, thanks, Anna, for that question. And we got an awesome comment from Jim, who was like, "Good good job for knowing what TCP or TPCC stands for." <laughs> I, I have you, to admit, I, I I had to. I had to look it up. I knew that TP was <laughs> transaction processing, but I started to stumble over the rest of it. Of it so I, I <laughs> looked it up. I, I totally did not want, know what it stood for either. Um, it's just one of those things. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. TMA, too many acronyms. But back yes, to you, indeed. Steve. Okay, cool. Okay, so as we can see, this is this is a bad query, but at least the performance is much worse than than we would like. So what can we do about it? We can, um, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll actually show what we can do about it a, a little bit later. But um, this is, a, this is a, a slightly different query that we're not going to fix that, um, that query, uh, at least not now. I'm just going to show a, a slightly different query where an index is used. Okay, so in this case, um, what's, what's the query? We're selecting the zip code from the same table customer where we've got some, some different uh, 
you know, conditions in the where clause where, where something is zero, something else is one, the last name is bar, bar, bar. And so now it's doing a scan. We've seen those before. And we've seen that uh, it's got this spans, but before now it's not doing a full scan. It's got this kind of cryptic looking thing. And bottom line, you don't have to really be able to decode it. I mean, we can certainly, you know, discuss that, but it's using the customer table and now it's using, you know, after the at sign here, you've got customer IDX. That's the name of the index. So it's using the customer index. And now instead of uh, scanning through 150,000 rows, look, the estimated row count is just two. And yes. then it's able to, to use that to do this thing up above that's called an index join. And now I want to call your attention to this because this is surprising. You see the word join, but wait, this is a simple select query. There's only one table involved. Why are we talking about a join? Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that uh, the value that we're selecting is the C zip column. This index, the customer index, gives you enough information to, to work with the where clause, but it doesn't have all of the data that's needed. So CockroachDB breaks this query into two parts. It does a good job. It breaks, uh, it, it first of all decides what rows we care about in the scan phase, and it uses that index effectively. Now, after CockroachDB knows what rows it cares about, it then goes to the primary table using the, that primary index and gets the uh, zip value out of it. So although this is good, we can do better. What we'd love to see is, is to get rid of this, this index join. And we'll talk about that more later. So this is kind of the bread and butter. Uh, is, is, uh, as I was saying, uh, you know, it's all about what is in the index. So let's look at the indexes for this table. We can say show indexes from customer. And, oh, this is another very busy screen. Don't, don't think that we've got uh, one, two, three. Don't think that we've got eight indexes. We actually have two. And that's because indexes, as you probably know, can be defined on multiple columns. So this uh, primary index is defined on the three columns that were part of the definition of, of the primary key. And then we've got this secondary index called customer IDX, and it's defined on five columns and here it lists the column names and so because of this uh, it's able to use this column in the scan phase but you'll see that uh, czip is not in the index and um, so as a result it has to go back to the primary table so we can we can uh, we can do better uh, as i said before you can also see the uh, table definition so let's do that right quick and just uh, Put it up here. So this is the definition of the table. Again, here's the primary key. I'm a big fan of looking at data multiple ways. It helps me, helps me, uh, helps yes. me take it in. It, it, yes. here, here's, here's the index. So yeah, you got to look at a puzzle from multiple angles, in my humble yeah. opinion. So looking at things in some more ways, I'm going to basically show some variety of query plans. And my goal is just to familiarize you with um, you know, some of the things that you'll routinely see, and also to kind of just kind of reduce the intimidation from seeing these, these kind of busy, technical, complicated looking things. So here's, here we've got a, a pretty good query. We're going to select something, an order line number, and a, an aggregate, the sum of the order line quantity from the order line table. And we've got a where clause, a group by, and an order by. And all of this stuff translates directly into the plan that we see. Reading from the bottom, we're doing the scan, and we're doing it on the order line table, and look, we get an index. So that's good. No full table scan here. And then we're doing the group by, and above that, we're doing the sort. So just want to show that this is a very typical looking type of query. Um, the other thing that I want to call out is that uh, you can control the amount of information that the explain uh, uh, well, keyword gives to you. So we did just basic explain. Now let's do explain with verbose as an option and see how much more information we get. It's not a whole lot more, but notice that we get column names that are included. And this can be helpful. And we can do even more. We can do opt and verbose. Now this is intimidating to me, the amount of information it shows. But I just want to kind of put it out here just to show that, that in the right circumstance, you can, you can show a, a whole lot of information. And, you know, I talked about the query optimizer relying on uh, uh, statistics and that those statistics are basically a histogram. Well, look, here's the histogram itself that's printed out and it's doing a lot of stuff. So I, again, I'm not going to unpack all this, but uh, 
these, I just wanted to say that you can, you can use these different options to control the amount of information. Uh, the other thing that's useful to call out is everything that we've seen up till now is just asking CockroachDB to explain the query. It does not actually execute the query. And so everything that it's shown in terms of, you know, number of rows, et cetera, are, are estimates. But we can, we can actually tell CockroachDB, explain it, but more than that, execute it and tell me what you got. So let, let's do that. The difference is that you use explain analyze. So this is going to be a starting point. We're, we're, we're going to just do explain select, very basic. And you can see it's just got estimated, no real data. But let's move over to doing explain analyze on the same query. And you'll see that now it's going to give you the real deal. And this time, look, so we've got the estimated row count, but then we've got the actual row count. And that's pretty good. Now, they're, they're both the same, which says that the uh, statistics were accurate. But sometimes if you see that the actual row count is very different from the estimated row count, that'd be a red flag that says, hey, the statistics are out of date. Um, and you've got lots of other things that I, I won't go into too detail, but, you know, the timings on cer certain parts of the internal, uh, you know, sequence of, of, of operations in CockroachDB. And so as a developer, this is, is what you would, would care about to uh, validate that your queries are, are working. And you get the, uh, you know, the timing of the query as well. So let's uh, just show a few more. This is going to be uh, showing how you can see some filtering and sorting going on using explain, analyze. And this time, look, ah, full scan. We don't like that. And we can see the, um, the row counts, both estimated and actual. Here's a filter, the price being greater than 100, and then we're sorting. And again, this is this is the query. All right, let's move on. I just want to kind of expose you at this point to, to various types of things. That, that's really the goal. So let's do uh, another one which does grouping by aggregate. So this one is, let's look at the query first. So we're doing explain, analyze, and select the order line number and the sum of the order line quantity. From order line, we've got this uh, where order line amounts are a certain amount, and we're doing the group by the order line number and ordering by the order line number. And so here you can see that the uh, estimated row count was 87,000 rows, but the actual row count was slightly higher, 90,000 rows. That's not a cause for concern. Uh, another thing that's helpful here is when it says the percentage of the table. You know, raw numbers like 87,000 don't necessarily mean a lot without context. And so you, you see that context here. And so this is what I wanted to show about the explain output. But that leads to the obvious question, what do we do about it when you see something that you don't like, which uh, the two that I've really called out are full table scans and index joins. Those are two things that uh, are, are really helpful to look for. So let's, uh, let's jump into talking about that. So uh, what I'm going to do, first of all, is just let's explain a particular query that does not have an index. So here it is. Here's our query. Select the order line amount and the order line quantity from order line, where the order line supply WID is, is equal to 100. And so it ran. And that's why it took a little while while I was speaking to, to it. It took 7.6 or so seconds to do it. And notice at the bottom here, full scan, red line, or red flag, I should say. And um, so cool. Let's let's see what we can do with that. Let's create an index. So I'm going to uh, copy and paste this create index command, and I'll talk to it while it's creating, because it might take a, a, about 30 seconds or, or or maybe even more to to do this. So it says create index, and then it gives the index name idx1 on order line. And then we're giving which column of the order line table we care about. That's OL supply WID. And you might have a question. It's like, well, if indexes can speed up queries, why would we uh, not create an index on every column? And the answer is that while indexes speed up reads, they slow down uh, all the other operations that are, are up uh, that uh, change the data. So inserts, updates, and deletes are made slower by the presence of indexes. And that's not actually too surprising because when the primary table is updated, 
uh, by an, either an insert, an update, or a delete, you have to uh, go change the indexes to make them be up to date with, with the values in, in the database. So that didn't take too long. It only took 31 seconds uh, to, to execute, but let's see what that does to the query plan. I'm gonna do the exact same explain analyze with the select statement, and let's look for a difference here. Oh, well, Steve, boom. again, does that take longer with a larger database then? You betcha, yes. Yeah. Index, index creation, uh, uh, even uh, more so than uh, the, uh, st the statistics with yeah. analyze, uh, this can can indeed run for for many minutes or or even even hours. Nice. It, it it really depends on on the amount of data, but uh, it's it's an intensive operation. And so uh, here, look where did what happened? First of all, that um, full table scan went away, and so that's that's the goal. And, and we went from from over seven seconds now to 46 milliseconds. So a huge difference. And the, the number of rows uh, was uh, vastly different. And, but we can do better. Notice that we've, because we're still selecting this order line amount and order line quantity, and they're not present in IDX1, the index IDX1, it still has to go to the main table to get the columns that it cares about. So again, this is in two phases. The scan figures out which rows we care about, and then the index join gets the values out of the, the rows that we care about. But we can do better by adding something that's called a covering index. And covering just basically means that the index covers all of the necessary values needed to answer that query. So this will take, again, I, I, I predict 30 seconds or maybe just a little bit longer because it's, it's got this extra uh, bit on the index definition. So the, it, just as before, create index, we've got the index name, and we tell it the table and the column, but we've got this extra piece over on the right. It says storing, and it gives two columns, the order line quantity and the order line amount. And these values are, are uh, stored inside the index itself. In fact, I'll tell you that uh, in CockroachDB, there's internally the implementation of indexes and the implementation of, of tables themselves are, are not very different. And so an index that stores um, extra columns in many ways behaves like a equivalent table that is simply storing the columns. And um, you can do this multiple ways. Uh, you could uh, define the index itself to have multiple columns and not use storing, but I chose to do it by uh, keeping the column uh, definition for that index the same, but adding the storing clause. The, the difference is, is subtle, uh, no need to go into it, but uh, now that we've got this uh, index that stores those two columns, Let's see what it does for the explain analyze. Here we go. And look, no index scan. We're totally solving this query in a single scan, and, and it's an index scan over the, over the uh, table. So we can ver verify, first of all, that uh, it's using the right index. We said order line, it, or it says order line at IDX2 instead of IDX1. So that's also uh, illustrating how smart the CockroachDB optimizer is, that it's smart enough to pick the best index. We had two indexes, both of which could uh, be, be used, and both of which would be better than not using any, any index at all. But CockroachDB uh, figured out that the second index would work better, and it chose it automatically. So that, that's pretty neat. And so uh, you can see you know, basically how, how it works. Uh, one thing else to call out is that the time is 46 milliseconds. Uh, I don't think that that is something that is really matters. First of all, it's within the margin of error of, of running these queries. If we were to run these queries multiple times, I think we'd see a natural variation. But it does call out the fact that with the uh, test, the way I set it up, it's a really small test. And uh, if you want to do a good performance testing with CockroachDB, CockroachDB is like a sports car. You really want, it, it wants to run, it wants to run fast. And you wouldn't do, you know, performance testing of a sports car by driving it slow. Same thing with performance testing with CockroachDB. You'll want to test it by giving it lots of data to crunch on. That shows shows its true performance. And uh, it. unreasonably small tests comparison. don't don't show as much as, as you would like to see. Nice. So uh, I'm going to get ready to kind of wrap it up. I'm going to switch to the slides, and I'm, I'm going to skip over, you know, things that. Um, that we, that we covered, but I, I just want to kind of give a, a, a kind of a wrap up of secondary index best practices. Mm -hmm. And I've talked before uh, based on, you know, that, that excellent question that came in to, that it's a good idea to understand the cardinality of your columns. And cardinality is basically, you know, how many distinct values are in the columns. And then 
Among those, choose highly selective columns. And they, they, they have to have high cardinality, but more than that, they need to have um, the values distributed in the way that when you do your query and that, that index is used, you can knock out a lot of rows from even being considered at all. Um, for composite indexes, that is an index that has is defined on more than one column, put the column with the high cardinality in the first column. And another thing, just like I said, it's not a great idea to create too many indexes, it may not be a good idea to, to create your indexes that have too many columns. So mm. as a ballpark, about three columns is, is, is a, a useful limit. I'm, I've seen more, and, and I'm not saying this is a hard and fast rule. Yeah. Uh, the next point is you use, use your covered index to avoid that um, uh, index join with the primary table. We, we showed that. Um, there's, there are other techniques that uh, we can talk about maybe tomorrow at our office hours, things yes. like partial indexes. Perfect. And uh, these things work great for subsets of data. And the, the basic idea is, uh, you know, look and verify. You know, look at the query plan, create the index, and then ver verify that it's being used. And, uh, you know, as you do your software development, I'll, I'll just say as a, as a developer that uh, oftentimes your, your, your code base changes over the, the lifetime of your, of your project, over your development effort. Yes. And so sometimes queries that would use indexes initially in your project may not be used later. So kind of audit and review periodically which indexes are actually being used and drop them if they're not being used. And, and so with that, how, I'd like to kind of just yeah, how go, go often, that, right? How often should people audit their code? Um, is that kind of depends on how quickly you're iterating or per major launch or? That, that's a great question. Um, it depends on how you organize the development effort. Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, uh, things are organized in terms of features, and mm -hmm. in an agile development environment, that might be um, associated with with an epic. And mm -hmm. so, epics are uh, you know uh, things that are, are, are big chunks of, of your development effort. And so, maybe for every effort, you could put a, put in a, a best practice as part of your um, continuous integration, um, continuous development process to, to check uh, on um, the indexes. Uh, certainly there's often a phase between development and kind of acceptance testing. Some, a lot of things that might be part of the checklist yes. towards the end of the development. Uh, and uh, I, I think that it's, it's really useful to look at the query plan for every uh, query that the application uh, generates. And, and, and look at that query plan and, and kind of go through a, a checklist. I've done this in previous software projects and found it to be valuable. Cool. So um, really, that's that's uh, that's it for the today. main stuff. Uh, look at yeah, looking at, at, at the, the clock, I, I could certainly talk some more, but I, I think that uh, <laughs> we, we 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 can uh, uh, if if there, let me let me pause here. Are there any questions on what we've talked about? If, if not, I will, I will indeed uh, talk about some of the advanced techniques that uh, that are all, we can also bring to bear. Yeah. And I also noticed that we didn't do every single step on the lab there's still um, quite a bit more in partial indexes um, going faster and faster and faster um, mm -hmm. and let's and do I, it yeah I, I encourage people to play uh, if we don't get to it today if if we don't have any questions we'll dive back in there yeah but I want to give people a chance to ask <laughs> um, good, good that was that was very solid. Um, well, let, let's go ahead and talk about uh, some, some things. Right? We, we yeah. talked about partial indexes a, a little bit, but uh, uh, kind of uh, let, me, let me talk before I get to that to talk about join methods. Nice. Uh, as we know, in relational databases, joining tables together is really an elementary and essential operation. It happens all the time. Some people think that joins are like, like bad. Oh, to me, they're neither good nor bad. They, they, they are uh, part of the way relational databases work. And, and I, I, I'm really impressed with, with joins and the power they bring to uh, the software development effort. Uh, there are three uh, main join methods in CockroachDB, a merge join, a hash join, and a lookup or, or nested loop join. And the thing that I wanna call out is, is not to kind of read the slide to you, it's just to call out that different join methods have different performance. And it's really good to try to get the best performance by trying to get CockroachDB to use the best performing join. And a merge join is at the top. It has high performance, 
but along with that high performance, it has some requirements before CockroachDB can, can choose that type of join method. And I'll just read those bullet points. Both tables must be indexed on the equality columns. So when you, or whatever the, the conditional column is. And so um, both tables have to have, have that index. Any indexes must have the same ordering. You know, indexes can be an ascending or descending ordering. And so they have to have to match. And you get a better performance and, and more efficient memory usage out of a merge join. So you could look at, at the query plan, do the explain output for your, your query, and it will tell you which type of join it is doing. And you can see right off the bat whether those indexes are present to meet the requirements of a join method. So uh, let's... Uh, and Stephen, yeah. I just wanted to add that the merge join is uh, very often used in CockroachDB is because uh, in our KV layer, we store data lexic uh, graphically. So in a particular order. So the data basically is already pre-sorted. Uh, That's why when we use merge join, uh, if we don't need to sort it on the fly, and that's why it's commonly used in CockroachDB. That makes great sense, Jesse. Yeah, when, when, with the data pre-sorted, then uh, if the indexes are there to, to utilize that pre-sorted data, then, uh, then the merge join can, can be used. That makes great sense. Uh, indexes are, can be really, really big. And, and yet there's a, there's a time when in your development, you might not care about all of the data in a, call, in, in a table. Suppose you have a, a, a table of customers, and suppose you have some customers that are active and other customers that are inactive. Uh, you might have a flag that you know, can tell you which of those customers are active and inactive. Mm -hmm. You might not really care about the inactive customers, the ones who are not active. And so it would be a waste of space to index the whole table, including those customers who are not active, uh, in order to make your queries more efficient. So CockroachDB gives you something that we call a partial index. So let me show you right quick. Let's cool. use the um, order line uh, table as, as, a, uh, as an example. So back to the screen uh, keyboard. So let's just first of all count how many rows are in the order line table. And we can see that there are 150,000 or so rows. But what if we care, say from a business point of view, only about those customers that have order lines over 9,000. So here we can see that it's 45,000-ish rows. That's about 3%. So you can see that it would be inefficient to index the whole table, to index 97% of the, the data, when we only care about 3% of it. So let's, um, let's also look, uh, in, in this case, uh, we're, we're looking at um, the uh, order line distribution info. And you can see it's just some random values. This is synthetic data. But suppose, uh, again, this is admittedly made up. Suppose we care about order lines that have an amount that's greater than 9,000 and that the, the distribution info starts with the letter A. I know that's made up, but let's, let's look at the explain analyze for this made up scenario. And you can see that, uh, first of all, we're doing explain analyze. So it's running while we're getting that explain out, but it didn't take too long, 5.6 seconds. We're doing a, a scan and we're using this index, IDX order line amount. And it's doing a, a pretty good job. It's getting, you know, the 48,000 that, that were estimated. And then, you know, here's the actual rows that were read. But the point is, it's using an ordinary index. And what if we create this partial index that I'm talking about and just index the data that we care about? So. Let's look at this while it runs. It's, it's, it's an ordinary create index. Create index, you give it the index name. And in this case, it's IDX dist info partial. And it's on the order line table. And it's on the order line distribution info column. But we've got this extra part at the end, just like we had seen storing stuck on the end of the, the create index. Now we've got a where clause. And that's pretty interesting. And so the point of, of the where clause here is that it's only indexing the rows that match that where clause. And the optimizer is smart enough that if you issue SQL queries with the same where clause, it's smart enough to um, you know, use that index. So let's put it to work and see how that does. Nice. And 
here it is. It's this, again, this is the same analyze as before, but we've put that new index in place and boom, we've gotten much faster where before it was. Um, it was, it was oh, instant. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, 5.6 seconds down to 181 milliseconds. And it's <laughs> using that, that index that we cared about. So nice. those are those are real values. And, and, it, and it shows that, uh, you know, even though we were using the index in both situations, the fact that the index itself was smaller helped uh, CockroachDB utilize its internal resources more efficiently. So this is an example, uh, again, of, of, of one of many techniques, and we're happy to explore more of them uh, tomorrow at our office hours. Yes, definitely. Um... That is all the time we have for today. I completely forgot to introduce myself. I am Rain Leander, developer advocate here at Cockroach TV. And I realized that after Steve got going, so I thought I'd wait till the end. Um, Steve, thank you so much for today. And like he said, and Jesse, thank you so much for questions and interactions and added value. This was awesome about query optimization. This is developing with CockroachDB. Tomorrow is the official office hours for today's module, but you can ask us anything. Um, tomorrow, I want to say, is going to be, uh, Steve, are you joining us tomorrow? Oh, yes. I look yeah. forward to seeing y'all. And Jesse, are you coming on as well or are you skipping? <laughs> I have a conflict with oh. customer meetings, unfortunately. Hashtag priorities. But... I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> we look forward to having you on here again in the future. Uh, we are also going to be visited by Alistair Perry and Bob Ferris. So I look forward to tomorrow's office hours, which are going to be at the same time as today, 12 o'clock Eastern time. and wherever you are watching this stream right now. Um, yeah, shout out to all the questions and comments. Thank you. Um, you really are the reason why we're here. If you are developing with CockroachDB, if you want to be developing with CockroachDB, we want to hear from you. We are here for you. Uh, remember that this is not the only resource, although I will say, that as you were going through the lab, I was like, I think if I was just going through the lab by itself without this video, I would I would miss so much value. There was so much context with every command, like, well, look at this, and this is how this is improving, and look how this and and I felt like I felt like if if you are doing the query optimization lab, like you'll get it. But with this video, so much more valuable. I loved it. Thank you so much, Stephen and Jesse, for being here today. Yeah. So next week, we are doing a Python module, which I will admit Python is my jam. So kind of looking forward to that. I'm a bit of a noob when it comes to databases and CockroachDB. Um, and oh, no. Uh, we definitely had someone complaining about the stream throughput. Um, and actually, I do have experience with StreamYard. Um, yeah, but we're having a good time with Restream. Uh, yeah, so see you tomorrow at 12 o'clock Eastern Time. Thank you, Stephen and Jesse, and we will see you soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.